I would like to start by saying this is how I approach this and I would really open this up for discussion and dialogue because this is my way, not the right way. <laughs> Let's just start with that disclaimer right from the very beginning. So a bit about the talk. I thought what I would do is tell you who I am and what skills I brought with me because I think it's really interesting how we approach this. This really defines a lot of how we, I think as individuals approach the facility. Um, then tell you what my challenge or objective was in terms of building the facility and where I was going to do that and the constraints in that environment. Then what I did and what I learned because boy did I learn a lot, I still am. So let's start at the beginning. My first postdoc was a really fun postdoc. It was actually located at NASA Ames Research Center in California, just south of San Francisco. And the objective of that postdoc was to study the toxicity of lunar dust on the eyes, skin, and lungs. Now, working for NASA was a really cool place to do my first postdoc, that's for sure. I got to do a lot of really fun things. Um, but where it really helped me was that when you get to go through the process of proposing missions for the lunar surface, talking about payloads and big instrument or small instrument packages, I think you go through a process of really learning how to think in the long term and in the large scale and on a bigger scope than I had ever been exposed to before. And that sense of long term, large scale, multi step planning was essentially the foundation of what it would be like to build a facility. The other thing I learned at NASA, which I love to this day, is the notion of the critical path. And this is something I implement all the time in my facility. If you don't know what the this idea is, we can talk about it later, but it's really the best for project planning. I left NASA and I went to the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg. And there, my second postdoc was focused on how to reconstruct the Xenopus Levis meiotic spindle at two nanometer resolution. Now, scientifically, this wasn't the most successful project, but in terms of um, learning how to design methodology and learning how to do experimental troubleshooting, it was absolutely perfect. And it became really a very strong foundation for how to do those things in a facility, how to MacGyver, how to bring all these different tools together into a workflow that will work and solve problems with what you had. It also gave me a really great opportunity to see a very well run, a very large scale facility. So the combination of those two skill sets, I think, was very powerful. And then the third one was an actually a much older skill set. So I am a farm girl, I grew up on a ranch. This is actually the house I grew up in. And in our spare time, I say as a joke, but yes, in our spare time, my family and I, we built this much larger house. I got a PhD before this house was done, just to give you the, the length time scales of this process. But it was really good in the process of building a facility and renovating an environment to know how to build things physically, how to, how to, how to do this as, a, as a, a tradesperson because I had done this. And this really helped me in the design of the facility to make sure the infrastructure was well set up. It continues to this day. This is my husband a few years ago. We went home for holidays and he got put to work fencing. He is also a scientist. So this concept of how to build, how to MacGyver and how to be flexible was really powerful. So bringing those three different, very random skill sets together, I think this was a really good toolbox to build a facility. So where was I going? I was invited to come to the Instituto Gulbenkian de Ciencia, which as Gleb said, is located just outside Lisbon, Portugal, um, in the town of Oeglish, which I always say wrong. I'm still Canadian, sorry. Um, and the objective I was given was to build an electron microscopy facility. That was it. I wasn't really told anything else, just to build a facility. I knew a little bit about the Institute, which was that there were about 30 scientists. At the, at the moment, we have nine core facilities, sorry, 30 scientific groups, 400 scientists. That makes a difference. Um, there were multiple core facilities, but I was actually the first person hired at the IGC as a person to run or to build a facility. Up until that point, people had been sort of adopted into leading a facility, such as a postdoc was in charge of an instrument and then in charge of two and three and four instruments. And suddenly they were assigned as in charge of a facility. I was the first person really brought in for this role. There are more since then, but it was a, it was a turning point for the Institute. 
The IGC also does a lot of very diverse backgrounds and, and biological topics, and it is an international institute, but predominantly the staff there are Portuguese. And this is very important if you're trying to build a facility, because although your scientific colleagues are functioning in English, um, many of the people I needed to work with, the maintenance teams, the background support, sometimes even the companies, they did not want to speak in English very easily. This was one of the things that I had to learn how to navigate through. So this might be useful for Jürgen. Jürgen, you were saying you were interested in building a facility in our networking session. So what did I do when I was facing this? Well, what I did is I collected information on everything I could think of. I tried to find out about different kinds of equipment, vendors, consumables. Where do you get this? What do you get? What is a good price? How do you navigate this? How do you stock up? Essentially, I just tried to collect as much information as I could. I also visited other facilities and quite honestly, I made a list of what I liked and what I did not like about every space I saw. And then I tried to address those good and those bad. Everything I liked, I tried to incorporate and everything I didn't like, I tried sometimes very unsuccessfully to solve. And the last thing I did is I built a one, a five and a 10 year plan before I even got to the Institute. I can tell you very little of that actually became life, but the fact that I had a plan, I think was really important to laying the foundation for where I would start the investments and how I would build the facility. So this is our facility timeline. This is what it will look like in the end, but let me walk you through this. So before my arrival, we received, or the Institute bought um, a TEM uh, just after 2010. And then in 2013, I finally joined the Institute. And very quickly, what we did is I, I designed a space with the, the, the floor plan they gave me or a small area they gave me. We renovated it. And then we started to bring the equipment together. Here we are moving the microscopes through the hallways and putting them in the space. And I hired and trained a team. Now, this was a question also in our session. The people I hired had very limited experience in electron microscopy. The person who had the most experience had a three week internship in this technique and she was the experienced member of my team. So I really trained them from zero. For good or bad, I taught them all my bad habits and hopefully a few good skills too. And then as we progressed through time, I tried to every year expand the technical capabilities we had. So in 2014, we brought in a high pressure freezer. It is, it was, and it still is the only one in the country. At the end of 2014, we finished our first CLEM experiment. And for those of you that don't know that, that's correlative light and electron microscopy. In 2015, we brought in microwave processing. We brought in more advanced equipment. You can see every year my objective was one or two technology steps forward that would expand our arsenal, our capabilities. This also was really helpful because as I brought in each thing, my technical team could learn it. So their technical skills were expanding as we were moving in the facility. The end result actually was that we got so busy and so big, we needed to renovate again, which was maybe a good thing because all the mistakes I'd made in the first design, I could now fix. So this was our first, the, the, the beginning of the renovation phase one. It went through a very messy period of time at this time. What I did with my team is I, I deployed them into different areas. So one actually went to Emble for three months to do sort of a study abroad. Um, one of them, one of my other team members, she went into a research lab and did an internship at the bench with a PI, and the third did uh, um, a degree course outside of the institute. So while we were renovating the lab, they all went out and did extra training. Then when they came back, what we had here, this is why microscope room one hidden behind here is where all the microtomes are. Here's microscope room two, and behind us, it was a nice new space that we could use as our wet lab space. This space was very carefully designed and to this day it is working for us extremely well. Even very simple things like the microwave is positioned in such a way that you open the door in the right direction to get from the fume hood into the microwave. You know, we really thought about this in detail and that is where all that renovation background really helped me. Microscopes were installed and away we went. 
at the end of or middle of 2017, we really started to push for cryo. Now this cryo electron microscopy, this was before the Nobel Prize was awarded for it, but we has, as a, as a group within the country, we identified this as a need and we started to try and target this. And towards the beginning of 2018, um, we also had a new direction in the Institute. Now, let me pause briefly and say, I'm pretty sure you all can figure out what this gray box is here. This would be the pandemic that's caused havoc in all of our lives. This one here, though, is a smaller one and a more personal one. So really, just as the Nobel Prize was awarded in September 2017, I had a sports accident that led to a spinal cord injury. And I spent six to eight months literally full time in the hospital learning how to walk again. I was still, because I'm a bit obsessed, I was still working remotely, but at a much reduced level. And it's hard to know if this time where I was out of the lab was the cause of it, or maybe the new institute direction. But you see that the next point in our milestone is me becoming president of the society and small upgrades in equipment. At this point, there was a change in how the institute approached the facility and, and I as the facility director wasn't able to lead as much. And so we didn't make as much progress. I'm back, I hope we can do some good things. And we were able to celebrate the start of 2021 in that finally, after so much time, we have received national funding for the cryo -EM, and we are currently in the tender process for it. It won't go at my institute, unfortunately, it will go at INL in the North and Mariana is here. She can tell us all about it if we want to talk about it later. So in the time where I have set up this facility, we have gotten all these different modalities working. They help us address a really broad scope of science within the community. It's not cutting edge always, it's not very fancy, but it's been able to address a huge need, not just within our institute, but also it's become a facility for the entire country. So yesterday, I just looked at a curiosity from 2019 to, to the end of June, 2021, these are just the list of some of the institutes we did service for within Portugal. Technophage and Nano for Global, these are actually both companies. Some of these institutes are our neighboring institutes. Some of them are even up north in other parts of the country. And some of them are in the more rural districts. So we support science across the whole country, which is something I never set out to do at the beginning, but it's an important um, aspect of the evolution of this facility. So what did I do well? Well, I think I hired a great team. Anna, one of the first team members to join me, the one who had three weeks of experience. Well, now she has almost eight years and she is nothing short of a master in this technique. I'm so lucky to have her as part of my team. And her and I together with various other team members, we've really built this together. The long-term plan was powerful. It's evolved and it's changed in response to the people that we are trying to do service for, but there's, I always have a plan. Whether I achieve it, we will see. I fought and I really did fight very hard for a very well-designed space that works for our needs from a technical and a safety aspect. And I'm glad I did that because to this day, our second version of the lab really serve us, serves us very well. With the input of my team, we implemented some quality control and documentation procedures from the very first day of the facility. And these are so, so beneficial. If you take any one of our plastic resin embedded samples for TEM, it will have a unique number in it. You can go to our, our list of samples and from there, you can find out when it was done, who did it, what was the sample, what was the protocol, even the lot numbers of all the reagents included in those experiments. If we were to set that up today, it would be a nightmare. But because we started it at the beginning, it really flows very, very well. Carefully thought out prices and uses strategies from the beginning are powerful because people don't like change. If those are implemented when you start, it's a lot easier than updating and changing things as you go through the process. Attending and hosting courses, there's always things to learn, whether you are the teacher or the, just the participant. I think being part of these is really powerful. I also ask my community for help and I really make an effort, although sometimes not perfectly, to be a good leader and a good manager of the facility. What I wish I could do over, 
I didn't ever think about the limits of an old building. I have built an EM facility in a building that's over 50 years old, and that comes with a hundred different complications and challenges from humidity to dust to everything. And if I had a magic pool of money, 0.3, uh, I would start with a new building and then some more infrastructure. And I would also... I didn't know I was building a facility for a country. I was building a facility for an institute, and that's a difference. So if you're trying to support science from all different kinds of research backgrounds, you're going to acquire different equipment. This is a bit of a political challenge at the moment because we serve so many um, different groups. How do we invest our next steps in infrastructure? I don't know. The take home messages for me or from my experience is it's better to implement with quality than with speed. Now, of course, you don't want to take forever. I'm not saying slowness, but you want to really do each step in a very well thought out way. Think long term if you can and think critical path if you can, you know, always make sure you can have redundancy in your facility so that if anything goes down or if anything's damaged, it does the work does not necessarily stop. As I mentioned, changing guidelines and prices is complicated, so be careful with this. Don't implement with the idea of updating every six months. Do it right the first time and take care of your team. They're the best asset you have. The IGC has many different facilities, so I just wanted to say I am one of nine facility heads. There's a great team of people there, and I'm really fortunate to work with them. Um, and I, I'm really lucky to work with these three ladies. They're a fantastic team. I can stop here. This is the last slide. If you have questions, please feel free to email me or check out our website.